damaged transport at the edge of the Gunming airstrip. Parts unable to be reclaimed for use in other planes are salvaged for aluminum. Salvage personnel check the plane for needed replacement parts. The plane is taken to the salvage department where a stripping crew removes the unusable parts. The scrap aluminum is then transported by truck to privately owned Chinese factories, which convert it into utensils that can be used to fulfill local army needs. The pieces of aluminum are broken down into small strips so that they can be placed in cauldrons and melted down. At this particular plant, the molten aluminum is poured into mold patterns for the making of mess plates. The plant is located within the city walls of Gunming and is managed by a Chinese graduate of Purdue University. The rough molds are trimmed and smoothed by Chinese workers using modern machine lathes. Mess utensils of converted aluminum are standard equipment in the War Area Service Corps hostile mess halls of the Gunming area. Each piece is stamped with a U.S. identification mark. An officer attached to the Purchasing and Contracting Division checks the finished plates before they're placed in a vehicle for delivery. Chinese coolies at work filling in the craters and holes left in the main strips of the Liuzhou Air Base by the Japanese when they evacuated the area on 30th June. The biggest problem involved in readying the air base is the many and various mines planted around the craters and hidden under loose dirt and gravel. The detonators are adjusted to explode under a few pounds pressure and a number of casualties occurred before proper warnings could be posted. The Japs use pieces of bamboo matting to cover the mines and to support the dirt and gravel hiding them from immediate detection. Air Corps engineers state that the air base is one of the most heavily mined areas encountered in China. A TNT charge is set to explode a mine. Some of the mines are U.S. 20-pound parafrag aerial bombs, which the Japs evidently found at Liuzhou when they occupied the section last November. One of these bombs accidentally exploded, killing an engineer captain, two enlisted men, and 50 Chinese soldiers. <laughs> Estimates of the total number of mines left here by the Japs vary from 1,000 to 1,500 on the basis of patterns of those already discovered. The airstrip, eight days after the engineers began the work of repair. A C-47 lands on a newly repaired field. First contingent of American service troops to be transferred directly to the Pacific Theater from Europe arrives at Manila Harbor after a month's journey from Leghorn, Italy. The transport Uruguay brings 4,275 veterans of Africa, Sicily, and Italy to the busy Philippine port, reconstructed by Army engineers after its destruction by the Japanese. The troops are mostly Negro personnel and come from almost every service branch of the 5th Army ranging from railway construction to bridge repair and ordnance. Other units of the Italian campaign will follow this first contingent until all American troops except an occupation force of approximately 28,000 are removed from Italy by the end of 1945. 70,000 troops are scheduled to leave the Mediterranean theater in August. They'll be shipped by units directly or indirectly to the Pacific. The troops march to railroad cars that will take them to their new camp. According to Under Secretary of War Patterson, the Army's redeployment program is now well ahead of schedule. Marine 
Marine Corps films of a new purpose anti-submarine mortar found aboard a Japanese freighter sunk in Naha Harbor at Okinawa. The weapon was the only piece of armament discovered on the freighter. The mortar has a horizontal traverse of 360 degrees, graduated on a scale which is on the carriage perimeter. The elevating hand wheel is manually operated. Crude markings on the adjoining shield display different angles of gun elevation for firing distances. The deflection scale and sight mounted alongside the mortar. The mouth of the bore measures 150 millimeters. The shell has four fins and an overall length of approximately 28 inches. Tests are now underway to determine the behavior of the shell for anti-submarine warfare. Navy films of Admiral William F. Halsey's third fleet grouping at an advanced Pacific base prior to departure for the shores of Japan. This aerial panorama shows only a portion of the most powerful striking force ever assembled as one unit in the Pacific. As the armada gets underway, activities topside and below decks are accelerated. Concerning the objective of the present operation, a naval intelligence report states that for a year, while southern Japan has been scourged by Allied warplanes, northern Honshu and Hokkaido have provided a haven for aircraft, shipping, railroads, and industries. Bombardment from the sea, coupled with strikes by carrier planes of Task Force 38, will now end this isolation. High-ranking Navy men follow the warships as they steam toward the Japanese mainland. During an extensive movement of this type, fleet commanders often fly from ship to ship or are hauled across open water on a bosun's chair. The transfer shown here is from a destroyer to the flagship of the third fleet. Range, bearing, ship positions are instantly and continuously reported. In the chart room of the flagship, Admiral Halsey and his staff prepare to give the order for the first naval bombardment of the Japanese homeland. General Quarters brings all hands to battle stations and the huge 14 and 16 inch batteries are readied for immediate action. This attack is to be featured by the breaking of radio silence with Admiral Nimitz providing a description of the battle while in progress and even identifying some of the ships engaged in the operation. Guns are aimed at Kamiishi on the east coast of Honshu, 275 miles northeast of Tokyo, and an important iron and steel producing center. The closest warship is within 3,000 yards of the shoreline. The target lies behind the first range of hills. Firing commences at approximately 1200, 14 July. The bombardment lasts one hour and 25 minutes. The particular objective of the attack, the Imperial Iron and Steel Works in the western suburbs of Kamiishi, is reported largely demolished. Fires expand into the harbor sectors of the city, and the entire area is covered by dense smoke. Lifting of a four-year security blackout shows the British battleship HMS Barham sinking after being hit by a salvo of torpedoes fired by a German U-boat. The battle wagon goes down four minutes after being struck. As the battleship lists, the crew scrambles over the sides. A magazine explodes. Eight hundred and fifty men are lost. On 
14th July, a hospital ship arrives at Honolulu Harbor, Oahu, carrying more than 350 nurses for the Hawaiian Islands and forward areas. This is the largest single group of nurses to arrive at Oahu since 1941. Most of them are from Ohio and Minnesota, and this is their first trip overseas. They'll replace nurses who've been on continuous service in the Pacific since Pearl Harbor. The nurses are scheduled for two weeks advance training in Oahu, which will include physical conditioning, orientation, and visits to army hospitals and other installations. A group of the nurses on their way to the Pacific Combat Training Center for orientation in some phases of the training given troops moving to forward areas. A demonstration of hip shooting with a machine gun. The nurses watch a demonstration of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. After being instructed in a number of the holds and throws, they try them out on one another so as to become proficient in the art of self-defense. Another of the courses through which the nurses are put is that of crossing streams. They are taught how to ride rafts and various kinds of floats, and how to cross ponton bridges, rope bridges, and other contrivances used in fording jungle waterways. A shortage of several hundred nurses in the Pacific area is expected to be remedied in the immediate future by the redeployment of nurses now in the European theater. <laughs> 